As the Tanzanian anti-colonial leader Julius Nyerere famously said, The United States is also a one-party state, but with typical American extravagance. They have two of them. While hyperbolic, there is some truth to the bigger picture of the sentiment. And given the extremely low voter turnout in the United States, it appears that many regular Americans intuitively sense this as well. While this is a common attitude among those who do not vote, most people who consider themselves somewhat political go about their lives acting as if they believe that this is not the case. You'd be quite surprised as to how many people in the mainstream media and mainstream political science departments still believe that the United States is a democratic republic representing the high point of liberal democracy, and that the two main parties, the Democrats and Republicans, are significantly different. And if one of them wins over the other, it represents an existential threat. Because it has two parties instead of one, the United States is automatically assumed to be a real liberal democracy like Canada, Britain, and France, unlike the so-called phantom democracies seen in the likes of Russia, Turkey, Indonesia, and the Philippines. Many people with eyes can tell that the United States is not very democratic, and a typical response to this is that, well, America is a republic, not a democracy. But no actually existing constitutional democracies are pure democracies. This is obvious. The argument being made in this video and in my other videos involving the United States is not the simple banality that the US is not a true democracy, but rather that it is extremely undemocratic even by liberal democratic standards. And despite being the most liberal of the liberal democracies, at least on paper, it is one of the least democratic ones. More importantly, we will analyze why so many people still buy into the democratic facade despite the evident lack of democracy. We will look at what exactly makes the democratic facade so convincing on a psychological and metaphysical level. How fake populists like Donald Trump actually reinforce the democratic myth, rather than accelerate its disillusion. And how this democratic mythology is deeply embedded in the unique history of America's founding which has allowed the United States to legitimize its authority at home and abroad more effectively than any dictatorship. By analyzing the simulation of democracy, I will introduce you to Jean Baudrillard's theory of simulation, which is where this relatively accessible video may start to become a little more complex. By the end of this video, you will get a better understanding of what we can call the two-party matrix and the simulation of US democracy. The Two-Party Matrix Since 1853, every single US president has been a Democrat or a Republican. Unlike most countries in Europe and even Latin America, the United States has never had a serious socialist or social democratic opposition party that represented the working class. The Democratic Party, originally an outgrowth of the Democratic Republican Party, has never been a workers' party or a social democrat party, like how the Labour Party in the UK used to be and all efforts to make the Democratic Party into one have been thoroughly crushed, often through very undemocratic means. For instance, party elites and powerful financiers within the two parties wield significant influences over which candidates become leaders. The so-called Democratic Party also has this very undemocratic practice of superdelegates, where the votes of party elites count significantly more than the votes of ordinary party members who vote in the primaries. Now, while there are indeed policy differences between the Democrats and Republicans, whose significance is often exaggerated by their rhetoric, whether they have disagreements does not tell us much about the degree of democracy that Americans have. Total ideological unity does not even exist in the most totalitarian states. In one-party states, members of the ruling party often have plenty of ideological differences, and one-party regimes have seen the rise of various leaders who have differed considerably ideologically and implemented completely different socioeconomic agendas. For instance, just consider how much Nikita Khrushchev differed from Joseph Stalin, or how significantly different China was governed under the leadership of Deng Xiaoping compared to Mao Zedong. However, the inevitable liberal counterargument to this is that multi-party liberal democracies lead to a system of power sharing, unlike one-party states. And they do have a point. But is this really true for the United States? The value of power sharing is supposed to be one of the things that differentiates genuine liberal democracies from so-called phantom democracies that are dominated mostly by one party. The American two-party duopoly does share power between different factions of the dominant property-owning class, but they hardly share power with ordinary citizens. If political power is to mean anything for the majority of citizens, it would be the capacity of a social class to realize its specific objective interests. This is the definition of political power used by Marxist theorists such as Nikos Poulantzis, 
and non-Marxist scholars such as the sociologist G. William Domhoff, whose study of distributive power essentially defines political power as, quote, the ability of a group, class, or nation to be successful in political conflicts with other groups, classes, or nations on issues of concern to it. In his book, Who Rules America, Domhoff developed three indicators of distributive political power. One, who governs, two, who benefits, and three, who wins in policy disputes. The empirical research outlined in this book found that the American corporate rich, which make up only 0.5% of the population, score higher on all three power indicators than their counterparts do in every other major industrialized democracy. The American corporate rich are overrepresented in the seats of government power, are statistically the most likely to have their wills carried through in decisions over alternative policy proposals, and enjoy a greater share of wealth than their counterparts do in all other industrialized liberal democracies. Now, that is not to say that getting rid of corporate finance will fix the root problem when it comes to the capitalist state ruling in favor of the corporate rich. I highly recommend checking out my article on Cosmonaut titled Why the Ruling Class Need Not Rule. Nevertheless, American politics are significantly more corporatized than they are in practically any other well-respected liberal democracy. Furthermore, party competition only entails a more democratic society insofar as citizens are given a greater ability to represent their demands, influence government policy, hold state officials accountable, and have alternative parties with different policies that they can vote for when the ruling party goes against their will. This is hardly the reality in the United States. Unless you consider the Republicans blocking any meager social reform as holding the Democrats accountable, to which the Democrats spinelessly accept, the reality is that for the most part, the two parties do not hold each other accountable for actions that concern the majority of citizens. Certainly not foreign policy, as practically every US president is effectively a war criminal. Check out Hakim's video on that. Definitely not the national security apparatus's curtailment of civil liberties, and not for most economic policies, where there is practically a consensus. And despite all the Democrats' woke virtue signaling, they are just barely different from the Republicans when it comes to immigration policy, with Barack Obama having the highest record for deportations, and Joe Biden continuing Trump's border wall. The great political theorist Sheldon Wolin sums up the contained opposition role of the Democratic Party as follows. Quote, Oh, the timidity of a democratic party, mesmerized by centrist precepts, points to the crucial fact that for the poor, minorities, working class, anti-corporatists, pro-environmentalists, and anti-imperialists, there is no opposition party working actively on their behalf. And this is despite the fact that these elements are recognized as the loyal base of the party. By ignoring dissent, and by assuming that the dissenters have no alternative, the party serves as an important, if ironical, stabilizing function and, in effect, marginalizes any possible threat to the corporate allies of the Republicans. Thus, the US can hardly be said to have party competition, one of the most lauded features of liberal democracy. Third parties exist, but it's damn near impossible for them to get elected to the House, Senate, and especially the presidency. This is due to a variety of factors, like the winner-take-all system of the US Electoral College, the inability of new parties to compete with the massive financial resources of the two established parties, and the lack of media coverage. Many popular demands don't even make it to the presidency due to the way that the US electoral system is designed, which makes it practically impossible for third parties to challenge the two-party duopoly. It's nearly impossible for third parties to gain traction in the first place because they are never platformed by the unaccountable corporate oligopolies who own all of the mainstream media networks that host the presidential debates. Not to mention all of the undemocratic institutional obstacles that come with the Senate and Supreme Court. As a result, the US government can get away with ignoring the demands of its citizens a lot more easily than other representative democracies. For example, a widely publicized study published in Cambridge University Press found that the preferences of the bottom 90% of income earners in the United States have, quote, a minuscule, near zero, statistically non-significant impact upon public policy. Yet the periodic rotation between the two parties and the constant circus of political campaigns, along with the cultivation of paranoia between Democrat and Republican partisans and their partisan-affiliated media, make the fantasy of democratic politics more believable compared to managed democracies where only one party dominates. The American system has been able to domesticate democracy to such an extent that it achieves the stability longed for by dictatorships while enjoying the legal legitimacy of a liberal democratic state.
Those who have studied political science, political theory, or sociologists like Max Weber would know that the concept of legitimacy is a crucial component to any socio-political order. Before the Enlightenment and liberalism, legitimacy under feudalism was based on the divine right of kings. Modern constitutional democracies are typically legitimized by popular sovereignty, aka the will of the people, the consent of the governed. Legally speaking, the power is legitimized by the people themselves. On the other hand, the legitimacy of absolute dictatorships and totalitarian states often depends on the regime's ability to economically perform or fulfill the stated role of the ruling party. Like for example, in the Soviet Union, the legitimacy of the party state was based on the Communist Party's ability to perform its stated function as a representative of the proletariat and progress towards the transition to communism. And how the socialist transition got defined eventually just got implicitly watered down into improving living standards. Thus, when the USSR's economy began to stagnate and living standards stopped improving, less and less people believed in the official ideology of Marxism-Leninism. And consequently, the legitimacy of the Soviet Union, like many other Soviet regimes, fell apart rather quickly. The more generic right-wing dictatorships, on the other hand, have a much more vaguer sense of legitimacy. Their legitimacy is usually based on the goal of restoring order, and is heavily tied to the dictator. And because the legitimacy of the state's authority is tied to the ruling dictatorship and not the people, such regimes are very prone to overthrow, and it's a lot easier to justify revolution. Unlike in liberal democracies, in which authority is already, at least formally speaking, legitimized by the people themselves. But today, many regimes that are effectively one-party dictatorships, such as Putin's United Russia Party and Singapore's People's Action Party, have adopted much more clever tactics when it comes to legitimacy. These more sophisticated dictatorial regimes, which theorists such as John Keane have labeled the new despotisms, actually legitimize themselves through popular sovereignty by having formal democratic systems with multi-party elections, at least on paper. But these elections are highly managed, though not directly rigged, in such a way that there is virtually no opposition to pose a threat to the ruling party. Yet, because the facade of their democratic process is not that believable due to being dominated only by one party and a hegemonic leader, their legitimacy is often paper thin. While they allow for more dissent compared to classic totalitarian regimes, these so-called phantom democracies tend to be fairly illiberal. The American regime, on the other hand, enjoys strong legitimacy through popular sovereignty, but without being beholden to popular will. The rotation of the two-party corporate duopoly within the spaces of political power fosters a more convincing illusion of democracy, akin to a game of football in which the people can only watch, but not participate. Any alternative non-corporate opposition parties that represent the working class majority are effectively blocked out. And as we saw with the separation of powers video, even if a populist working class candidate were elected, America's unique system of checks and balances are designed specifically to prevent any kind of popular rule against the propertied minority. America is unique because on paper it is the most liberal of the recognized liberal democracies while being among the least democratic in practice. At least on paper, people in America have more formal liberties to criticize the government than people do in any other country. But this freedom to criticize only fosters a democratic illusion as the people are rendered powerless, as they are given no real institutional means of seriously challenging the shared monopoly of the established parties and their policies. And unlike a one-party state, a political system with internal binary oppositions better synchronizes with human inclinations towards dualistic thinking and in-group-out-group dynamics. The illusion of democracy becomes more real than real through the hyper-real carnivalization of politics, the media circus maximus of partisan disputes, a simulation of political polarization masking the absence of any real politics. Let me explain what is meant by the word simulation. I am referring to Jean Baudrillard's theory of simulation and hyper-reality, which is not quite the same thing as what is depicted in The Matrix, contrary to what this title might suggest. Jonas Cheka, the YouTube channel CCK Philosophy, has a great video showing why the Matrix movie gets Baudrillard's ideas completely wrong, even though it is a good series. Explaining Baudrillard's ideas in such a short video would be a Herculean task, but I'll briefly give a short account of the idea of simulation and how it applies to this video. The Simulation of U.S. Democracy The word simulation denotes how the phenomenon of contained opposition takes on a distinctly new form in modern, or shall I say, postmodern times. It's inspired by Jean Baudrillard's theory of simulation and hyperreality, which is extremely difficult to explain and I highly recommend my podcast on it. 
But one of the key ideas is that imagery and mediatized representations of reality have reached such a level of technical perfection that they have become hyper-real, that is, more real than reality itself. But the degree of perfection that reality can be codified for us through simulation has a disenchanting effect, as it increasingly leads to the extermination of illusion and human imagination. The forces that are capable of allowing for the reversibility of meaning and radically altering the existing symbolic structures. This can be a bit difficult to grasp, but just think about it on a practical level. Despite the real lack of new and substantially different alternatives on the political scene, many are convinced that polarization is at its highest, and that America in particular is more politically divided than ever. How do people come to believe this despite the absence of any real politics? One of the reasons why is that the increasingly hyper-real mediatization of the political spectacle makes people much more invested in it on a libidinal level, all while lobotomizing our ability to actually imagine new radical alternatives to the existing state of affairs. The simulation of the news cycle and the implosion of meaning in the media creates a facade of politics all the time, when in reality, politics is rare and sequential, and events are scarce and ephemeral. By their very nature, events represent a rupture in the established logics of the existing world. Considerably low voter turnout in the United States suggests that many Americans are not quite as enchanted by the folklore of US democracy as much as the preachers of its gospel are. Notwithstanding the ardent fan bases of Team Republican and Team Democrat, the biggest believers in US democracy appear to be none other than the nation's most educated minds, such as academics, media professionals, middle class managers, who are part of the broader category that some describe as the professional managerial class. The 2016 election of Donald Trump, and even more so, the infamous January 6th incident, aroused media panics about the supposed loss of American democracy, and the need to protect America's democratic institutions, and combat populism. Trump did not fundamentally change America's institutional structures when he was in power. He just packed the Supreme Court with more Republicans, as other Republican presidents have done before. So what they really mean when they say that Trump represents a threat to American democracy is that he represents a threat to the legitimacy of American democracy, and that he undermines American hegemony by tarnishing the country's image, not the reality behind the image. But is Trump really a crack in the matrix? Does he really undermine the simulation of US democracy? I think not. Quite the contrary. If anything, the spectacle of Donald Trump helped reinvigorate the facade of US democracy and gave a whole new meaning to the Democratic Party's hollow existence. As was the case with Richard Nixon after the Watergate scandal, the depiction of Donald Trump as an authoritarian exception to the noble rules of liberal democracy, far from saving democracy, restores faith in the noble lies that legitimize the very institutions that obstruct democracy. In other words, Trump's election woke some people up from the American dream of democracy only to give them sleep paralysis. The simulated facade of US democracy has to be maintained at all costs to absorb radical discontent back into everyday politics, and to ensure that people still recognize the state's institutions. Believing in this myth of democracy, the duty to believe in it, or more importantly, act as though one believes it, is one of the few civic virtues still expected of the domesticated American citizen. If the simulated code of the system's democratic formalities no longer produce their legitimating effect, politics could become political, and this Pavlovian democracy could turn fugitive. With Americans becoming increasingly disillusioned with the prospects of electoralism, it is likely that America's illusory democratic legitimacy will hinge on its ability to conjure new threats to it constantly invoking the threat of fascism, which will help manufacture consent for the existing system. The scapegoating of more far-right candidates like Donald Trump and his clones has a conservative effect that makes the liberal order seem a lot better than it actually is. However, this is certainly not to fetishize revolution and disorganized violent protests. Spectacles of depoliticized and disorganized violent agitation can reinforce the illusion of democracy in its own way. The mythology of American democracy is deeply rooted due to its unique revolutionary history. Unlike America, which was the first country to establish a republic completely freed of feudal vestiges, for most countries in Europe, liberal democracy was established more gradually, through a protracted struggle waged by the oppressed classes against the lingering feudal classes and the conservative factions of the bourgeoisie who sided with them. 
Contrary to America, there was an enduring feeling in Europe that the democratic revolution had been left unfinished, and required constant struggle to create a more democratic society. The deeply entrenched myth that the democratic revolution has already been completed in America is one of the many reasons as to why the US regime has gotten away with such undemocratic tendencies for so long. While neoliberalism and neoconservatism may have been the nails in the coffin in undoing the demos, Americans must undo the spell of their national mythology to rebuild it. If you get value out of videos like this, consider supporting my work on Patreon. By becoming a patron, you get access to our Discord community and a bunch of exclusive content, like podcasts and lectures. You can also press the super thanks button to donate what you believe is the equivalent of the value that you received from this video. Thank you very much to the patrons who have supported my work so far. You make these kind of videos possible. And let's be honest, you don't find this often on YouTube, and certainly not the mainstream media. Be sure to leave a like and a comment, and stay tuned for the next video.